I got offered an, a number that I think very few people in this world would have said no to. Every athlete in this world usually goes where they get paid the most and where they can win. Luckily, golf is an individual sport. I can still play majors. I can still win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Now he's excited. I think I have the biggest overreaction to making a four-footer ever in golf. And that was the, the winning putt on 17. Ryder Cup week, like I was playing terrible, terrible golf. And I see the parents and I get paired with Tiger Woods. The panic level was at an all-time high. <laughs> my first ever Ryder Cup point, I beat Tiger Woods, which is my all-time hero. The feeling of my grandpa and saving up in heaven, right? So that's why that reaction was what it was. You got a baby under your arm. I think I grow him and I say, you have no idea what just happened. Not to only win a major, but to be the first Spanish player to ever win the US Open was quite incredible. You dream of things like that, but when it happens, it's actually hard to believe. I couldn't sleep that night seeing that putt over and over because I couldn't believe that it actually happened. There's a little tournament in Augusta called the Masters. A lot of times I've thought of, imagine we actually have a tap in to win the Masters. <laughs> like imagine, right? So you kind of need to keep yourself on the moment and, and battle those thoughts that, you, that that come in. But it's it's a green jacket, right? It's just a green piece of cloth, but what type of awe does it bring to people when you show it to them? Most people are speechless. A lot of people get a little emotional. I get emotional, right, if I start thinking about it too. Well, this is a treat. We've had one previous Masters winner on the Howie Games. His name was Adam Scott. Now we've got the former number one, the current Masters champion, a man that has moved to live golf. He's one of the biggest sports stars on the planet. We met about 18 seconds ago. John Rahm joins on the show. John, great to see you. How are you going? How are you doing, Howie? It's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Mate, I'm pumped you're on the show, so I'm on a short break um, up in northern New South Wales in Australia at the moment. You are coming in from Saudi Arabia, yeah? We're in Saudi Arabia, yes. Okay, so tell me, I, I'm privileged to travel around covering sport, um, a sport called cricket, which you wouldn't know much about, and I've just been in India, I love to get out and explore things. Are you ma a man that gets out and explores the places you go, or you're stuck between the hotel and the golf course? Uh, I think it's a mix, it's a mix. Sometimes the, the course and the hotel we're at are a little bit too isolated, and that happens more often than you think, so I, we just don't really have the time, right? It's not like... Golf usually takes quite a bit of time, so when you wake up, work out, do media, practice, it's a little bit too late before you can actually go and do something, so uh, it all depends on the week. If I can, I will. If not, obviously, it's not, it's not my top priority. And there in Saudi Arabia, we hear so much about Saudi Arabia, 99.5% from my perspective, John, from people that haven't been. So you're there. T tell me about your impressions of the place. I'll tell you right now. If I took a picture out of my window in the resort, looking out at the Red Sea, you'd have no idea this is Saudi Arabia. Right. Now, right. if you turn around and look towards land, obviously you're gonna see a whole lot of sand, but yeah. uh, that's uh, the desert for you, right? I mean, that's the same with Arizona. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite different, right? Landing in yesterday into Jeddah, I had no idea how big of a city it was. Uh, you could see the traffic throughout the city. Um, it's, it's different. Is different than I thought it was going to be, right? I've been fortunate enough to be in the UAE and be in Dubai and have an idea, but it's a lot more modern in a lot of places than I think a lot of people would expect. Uh, it's a lot of, a lot safer than a lot of people would expect. It's 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 gotten a bit of a, obviously negative press, uh, a bit more than it maybe should have. And I think if if somebody who hasn't thought about it opens their mind a little bit and thinks about possibly coming to places like this, would be they would be gladly surprised. Well, mate, I hope you get to get out and about and explore it. Now, I, we've got a limited amount of time. I, I want to speak to you about your golf journey. But from what I can see, you played golf in Australia once before, the World Cup at Kingston Heath. Yeah, is that the only time you've played here? Only time I've been to Australia. Oh. I did go early and enjoyed playing at uh, New South Wales Golf Club. So I've been oh. able to play at least one other golf course in Australia while I was there. And now you are coming to Adelaide, uh, 26th to the 28th of April. Tickets still available, limited corporate tickets. It's on the Seven Network. From what I can see, from what I can see, Liv is bringing a whole new level of entertainment to golf, which I love. I think they're going to love you, John, um, and they'll call you Johnny over here. Well, you've got to realise when you get here, they're going to call you Johnny because you're a man that plays with passion, I'm sure you've spoke to some of the Aussie boys about it. Have you heard much about Adelaide? Because they're going to love you. They're going to love you in that joint. Uh, I can tell you right now, from anybody I've spoke to, related to Liv and uh, and players, you know, management, everything. 
I think Adelaide was unanimously favorite tournament last year. Uh, and I, we all saw the images. We all saw the watering hole. We all saw the atmosphere. So it was my number one destination looking forward to. Obviously, Valderrama is yep. something I, where I want to play. But I know the golf course. I kind of know what to expect in Spain. Australia, I don't know what to expect, right? I haven't been there since 2016 or 17. So my memory is incredibly good. Kingston Heath is one of my favorite golf courses in the world. And I've heard this one is also amazing. So uh, I can't explain how much I'm looking forward to this one because it, it seems like it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think this is one of the great things about Liv. Greg Norman came on this podcast, John, a year and a half ago and dispelled a lot of the myths about Liv and, and gave his reasons about why he was involved. But I think the fact that in Australia in the past, unless it's the President's Cup, probably we haven't seen the creme de la creme of world golf and now we do. And I think that had a real impact on the Australian sports fans last year. So it's great to see the level of golfers that we now get to see thanks to Liv, which, you know, as I said, mate, there's so much talk about it, but I'm a massive fan of the fact you guys are here and you're coming and you're entertaining. Uh, you know, I think it's one of the big objectives of Live Golf and one of the reasons why they decided to transition, right? It's, it's, it's playing golf in places that I haven't played before. Very simple. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of golf communities that deserve a bigger level of golf that they never got to see, right? I mean, you have three of the four majors in the U.S. And yeah, before you had WGC, some of them were outside. But for the most part, you're playing in some countries in Europe in the U.S., right? You never really get out of that. So to be able to, to enjoy Saudi Arabia this week, Hong Kong next week, and then we have Adelaide and Singapore, it's amazing. And you, and you get to be exposed and you expose golf to a crowd that maybe hasn't seen it before or a crowd that is hungry for golf. And Australia always seemed like that type of place. I mean... I remember growing up watching golf and seeing some of the best players in the world go and go there in December to play the Australian Masters, Australian PGA, yeah. and the Australian Open, yeah. right? And the last few years, that kind of died down. COVID obviously had a lot to do with it. Uh, and it's great that we're back in there and to see that, you know, Australians want us there and want to see the best golfers in the world. And, and as players, you want to entertain a crowd that wants you there. That's nothing more fun than that. Well, it's going to be great to have you here. I, I guess it's been a really interesting period for golf for the last three years because, like many sports, it's been torn in a couple of directions. Before we get to why you decided to join Liv, and congratulations for, for signing and and setting up your family for generations to come, which we'll get to, mate. Massive congratulations and reward for your talent. How has it been the last few years as a professional golfer while in some ways the sport's been torn apart. Now, hopefully it gets joined back together, but ha- how's that been a professional in that environment, John? Well, no change is easy, right? And I think yep. in both sides, there's a lot of question marks, a lot of unknowns, and that can be unsettling for a lot of people, right? So I think 90% of the players fall under that category where they don't know what's going on and they're just spectating, waiting to see what happens. Um, when it comes to the change, well... I think as humans in general, we just don't like change, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing, right? In order to improve anything, you need to change it, right? And and that's uh, that's something to get past, right? If you cannot, as a player and as a golf fan, you need to have the open mind to maybe explore different options and accept that it could be better for everyone, right? And... Uh, I think that's what a lot of players have done. That's what I certainly did. And I think uh, Liv is making a positive change in the game of golf, right? There's a little, a few differences. You have the shotgun stars, you have the three rounds. But I can tell you as a player, once you're playing and once you're in it, I completely forget that it's only three rounds until people remind me. Right? Competition is competition, period. And it's certainly not the first sport to go through it, right? Uh, certainly cricket went through a few changes right you have five day cricket you have three day cricket, absolutely now you have basically absolutely. one day and it kind of keeps getting smaller and smaller just because everybody's busy it seems like everybody's attention spans a little bit shorter and you know having your competition in certain hours of the day is just always going to be easier as a product to sell so um adding that to the change in atmosphere right you have a little bit of music and and a different vibe i think it just appeals to a younger generation that maybe they didn't have golf in their mind and for people that haven't seen it, I really encourage to come and watch because it's it's different and it's fun. It's it, it's very very entertaining. It, I'm, I've always been a golf purist, right? Just loved the game forever. I never wanted to see certain changes, and you know, uh, kind of opened my horizons a little bit by seeing how 
this is, has evolved a little bit in how much more inclusive it is than people think. Yeah, I think DJ Fisher, an Australian bloke, is playing in Adelaide. Now, John, I don't know what you like out on the uh, dance floor on the disco, but he's a very talented man. I didn't expect to be discussing cricket with you, I've got to say, but take me behind the scenes as much as you can, John, in a snapshot, your thought processes, was there a, was there a moment? Did you speak to Greg or another player? What, what made you decide as the, you know, the world number one, the Masters champion, you obviously knew the impact it would have on Liv making that decision. As I said again, congratulations on that decision. Talk me through it. All right, how much time do we have? Um, well, that's up to you. I, I got hours, but that's up to you, John. <laughs> to you, John. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's an extremely complicated process to try to narrow down quickly, right? Um, I was never completely against it, uh, even though I had my my thoughts about live right and, yep. and i made in public yep. I, you know i wasn't the biggest fan of the format right away right and i've never wanted to make decisions on my career based on money but as a father yeah I've, that mindset changed a little bit yeah uh, and i i, I realized yeah. for people watching this when i say what i said at the u.s open i was already a dad but you know growing more into the role of a dad you kind of change a little bit and um yeah, I mean, I got offered a, a number that I think very few people in this world would have said no to. That that to begin with and get that out of the way, because obviously it's a big part. And to be honest, every athlete in this world usually goes where they get paid the most and where they can win. Luckily, golf is an individual sport. I can still play majors. I can still win. So I don't know why that's such an issue nowadays for, for golf alone, but that that's besides the point, right? You, you can Well, it, it you shouldn't want. be, is it? Because like you, you mentioned cricket, you, you know, basketball, NFL... Um, every sport, you pay the athlete what the athlete's worth. So, yeah, I, I'm with you there. I don't get the fuss. If the market says you're worth reportedly $600 US million as a sign-on fee, then, you know, good luck. That, that's reward for talent in the market, surely. I mean, that's how I see it, but that's uh, it's easier for me to say now, obviously, uh, having accepted that. Um, yeah. But the main thing was uh, once the PGA Tour made that agreement, right, when the framework agreement came out, when none of us had an idea and all of a sudden that gets published. I think that changed the dynamic. In my mind, it changed. Okay, if this is going to be the future of golf, then I owe it to myself to see what's out there and see the product. And then I started asking questions, right? A lot of the people that practice, where I practice, were in live golf and spend a lot of time with them because they're friends. And I, I started asking questions and seeing the dynamic. And inevitably, inevitably at some point, uh, I wanted to hear from higher people. So I did meet with Greg, I met with other other management and and try to hear out what they what they had to offer because to be honest up until then i didn't really know i didn't know mm. the future vision i didn't mm. know what live golf wanted to do right all i heard was basically what media said which was never a, a really positive thing which uh, to be fair i didn't believe everything they said so uh once i got more information i said well this this is definitely something to consider right and uh it's, it was a family decision. I would never want to do something that, you know, my wife or anybody in my family would be against. And uh, having their support and, and going through pros and cons, which I could get into it for a very long time, uh, I ended up deciding to go, right? I think um, if you look at my stage in my career playing good golf, I just won the Masters, five-year exemption for all majors, right? Uh, my value as a player would say would be an all-time high. I think it was the right time for me to go. And maybe be able to make a positive change for the better, right? And uh, hopefully seeing both uh, both tours come together again, right? Because at the end of the world, at the end of the day, we all want to compete against the best, and I think everybody wants to see the best compete against each other. Yeah, it's, it's very similar to what Cam Smith said, and I, I asked this question to Cam, uh, John, and as I said, we've only been chatting 15 minutes, so I don't want to ask it in, in, a, in a crass dollar sense, but I, I asked Smithy about the responsibility that comes with that type of wealth and and what you can do for your family and generations of your family. What type of impact? I don't know if responsibility is the right word. What, what type of impact has that had on you? So I would only feel comfortable with myself if I invested this type of resource in a way of giving back to the game that has given me so much. Right, like okay. I said, the, the game. Okay. I love the game more than anything else. So, I've I've said in many interviews for anybody that follows me, uh, what Sevi was able to do in Spain and in Europe, right? Beyond 
accomplishments on the golf course it was incredible. When he started playing golf, there was only 15,000 licensed golfers in Spain. At the time of that, there was 350,000. Huh, wow. Uh, the huh, amount of golf wow. courses were incredible. So if I can add on to that in any way possible, right, I think it's also a success. Not only – I usually try to say Spain because I'm from there and I want to give players an easier path to get to where they want to get to. Uh, but if I can do make an impact anywhere else in the world, it'd be great as well, right? Uh, so I've had for a few years, uh, since COVID has been difficult, but we've had what we call John Golf for Kids, which is a bit of a take on the draft chip and pot for, for younger kids. But I want to be able to involve that, right? I, the, mainly the Spanish Golf Federation runs amateur golf in Spain, but maybe with my rise, I can add on and, and add more tournaments that people can access to and play and, and, and you know, develop themselves on. Uh, if I can do it in the U.S. as well, the, the, this definitely have a few, a few ideas, right? Luckily, I grew up close to a very accessible driving range in Spain. Uh, very few public golf courses when I started. Mm. Uh, so my mm. swing coach back in Spain had a range that you could just go into. You paid a two euro entry, then you could rent clubs, or you could just be on the putting green for the rest of your life, and that's it, right? So right. having more accessible right. places like that, and that would be easier to do in Hello. Arizona. Um, there's little things like that that would improve the stage of the game and give people more access to play game and, um, you know, give give somebody the opportunity to be exposed to golf that maybe wouldn't have been in the past is where I, I see myself doing, right? And I think that's the right thing to do for me for what the game has done for me. It's a great answer. You're going to see this man, 26th to 28th, at the Grange of April in Adelaide. Get your tickets if you if, uh if you've got any interest in sport. All right, John, let's let's talk about, you just talked about the, the local driving range. Why golf? Like, what's your first memory of golf? Was it watching on telly? You mentioned Seve. Was it having a hit with your mates or a relative? How'd you get into this beautiful game? So my dad started playing golf later in life, closer to his 40s. Uh, I was young then. And the way my, my parents say it is they would pick me up from school and they would go get their golf lesson. And they say, sometimes I fell asleep, sometimes I had a snack, sometimes I just watched, and then one day I just tried. I think I was around seven or eight, and, 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 and I tried to play golf and, and just hit it, right? And I do have that memory of going up there with the club and trying to hit it. So my earliest memories are, yeah, going to that range and, and kind of grabbing a golf club for the first time and, and going through that process that we all go through, right? Of the frustration of not hitting the ball and then uh, <laughs> learning how to hit it, right? And then shortly after that, my parents got me into lessons with uh, collective lessons with other kids and, and, and the love grew, right? Obviously, being from Spain, I think every kid at some point that plays any sports, like, oh, I want to be, be a football player, right? Like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You just want to play football. Yeah. I want to yeah. play for Atleti Bilbao, yeah. and that was it. Like, there was no other thing related to sports early on. And uh, once I started playing golf, things changed pretty quickly, right? That's when, you know, I fell in love with the game. There's something special about the game. And probably because it was such a family thing we did. Right. I think uh, I had such positive memories with it early on that that made me gravitate towards it. And apart from being severely more talented to play golf than to play football or any other sport. <laughs> so I, I often ask this question of the guests that come on this sh- Sean show, John. There's part ability and there's there's part hard work. Were you within six months or a year, the kid that everyone else was playing against saying, oh, no, oh, we're in the cop against Johnny Rahm. He's going to destroy me? Or were you – you're shaking your head. You're a kid that had to work hard, yeah? No. No, that was – it was a slow process. So I started playing at eight, and I think – I mean, we're talking about young ages, right? But yes. I didn't yes. become that player up till I was 14 going on turning 15. Okay. Okay. Uh, but it was it was weird because I think it was when I hit my growth spurt. It was when I was about fourteen, right? So it was that that it was over a winter. Like I was okay. It was I was good in my region. Uh, was able to finish top five once in the national level, but I was never the player. And then that winter, I grew exponentially. <laughs> I grew to pretty much the size I am right now. Uh, maybe not like that, but I mean, at thirteen, I was definitely I think. Uh, you do you do meters right meters we do meters yeah. we do we meters, do meters yeah. we okay do meters. so I was meter eighty five something like that something ridiculous right I went from being average to the tallest of my class by far with that came a lot of distance and certain improvements when I started seeing my golf coach Eduardo Theis at the time and uh, I was able to win my first ever national tournament that January of the of 
when I was 14 going on to 15. And and what did that mean? What what did as as a 14 year old? What did victory mean to you? Because I, I want to talk through various victories you've had and what they've meant. I, it was my first ever like really like round in the 60s, I believe, in a tournament that was big. Huh. And uh, I teed off way before the leader shot four under, I believe, in the final round and ended up winning. Right. Nobody expected me. I ended up winning like I was done hours before. And <laughs> and uh, yeah, here I'm the champion. Like some the people around my region knew me, but a lot of people in Spain did not know who I was. And then that's when I became a bit more of a name. But then that same year, the Spanish under 16 championship, national championship was at my home club, hosted by my home club. A little bit of home court advantage. And I was able to win that by nine. And that's when nine shots. Shot, right? that's nine it. shots. I won that by nine. Wow. Okay. That's when my confidence okay. went to a different level and I became the player to a player to be reckoned with. And uh hard to explain how I felt. Um I mean you're so young, it's like you don't know how to deal with those things, right? I think uh my first time ever having a lead going into Sunday and, and shooting a good round and and winning by a margin. It was just fun to be able to enjoy the last few holes with, you know, with knowing that I had won it. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's, I think you're so naive that I, I almost, my thought was, okay, I won more, right? It was more than just that. There was, there's more things to accomplish and it was early on. Um, but I can't quite remember how, I mean, it was late, I felt very happy about it. And I remember feeling almost more nervous for the speech than actually competing. <laughs> I'm sure you nailed it. You went on to study, um, in the States. So you go to college in America. So a lot of athletes in Australia in, in world sports, especially football, John, they move, you know, some of our, our, our big name footballers leave at 13, 14, 15 years of age um, to pursue their dream. You're obviously a little bit older than that. And I'm sure you'd seen a bit of Europe. I don't know about the world. What, what's it like as a young man packing up his golf club, saying goodbye to his family and pursuing golf and education on the other side of the world? So... I did spend my last two years of high school in, in Madrid. So I'm from Bilbao, different city, yep. right? So yep. I've been away from my parents for a decently long period at, at a time. Um, and, and, and that helped a lot because I grew up speaking in classrooms. I grew up speaking and learning in Basque. Of course. I had a transition to Spanish, which was a bigger change than most people would think. So going to the U.S., longer flight, but the change was... Obviously, a more difficult, but I, I had some experience on it already. Uh, it is more of a cultural shock, to be honest. I never had time to go and visit. You know, I go. I grew up in a town with thirteen hundred people, and then spend some time in Madrid, but very isolated part of Madrid. And then I go to Arizona State, which is one of the biggest <laughs> universities in the world. Uh, grew up in the cold, and landed in August in the desert. I mean, the the change was about as big as you could ever imagine. Uh, and it took me some time, right? Also, the English I was used to was UK English, right? English English. That's what they teach you. Yes. Right? I'm going yes. to American accents. It, it's, it was a change. It was a change. It took a good month for me to settle in. And unfortunately, it showed on the golf course. But once my English got to a high enough level, everything became a lot easier. But it was, it was a solid month of struggle. Uh, the first month wasn't easy. But again, I think you're so young and so naive and so immature that you don't know anything different right i mean you just kind of think it's normal and, and that's about it i mean you deal with it and uh and i remember my coach saying that he didn't think i was going to last more than two weeks uh he, <laughs> thought, he thought i was going to quit and go back to spain and i don't blame him because i was quite quiet but throughout that time and the difficulties because uh, i got in trouble a lot for honestly just not understanding what they were telling me uh i could kind of find my safe spot safe space on the golf course right and and play uh. golf. And even though my first tournament was not great, starting on the second one, thing, things got a little bit better and, and uh, easier for me. So tough change, tough to be away from family. But again, I think when you're so young, you just don't know anything different. We'll get to winning the biggest tournament. It's almost like at that point, you just want to be away from your parents, right? Like, I don't want somebody telling me what to do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like, you don't have to do yes. homework. You can, you know, there's nobody's not mom telling you what to do. Like, <laughs> It's somewhat fun at first, and then once the panic starts hitting in and the problems come in, it becomes very difficult. <laughs> but there's, you know, there's like, well, I don't have a bedtime. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> uh, I've got a 12 and a 14 year old. I think your kids are a bit younger than that, but trust me, it's pretty early on when they start not really wanting to do what you do. But I'm sure that's coming your way. Um, 
the um, before we get to the big tournaments, as I said, that I'd like to get your get your views on how you physically, mentally prepare and that type of thing. What's your first check in, in golf? Um, I, I guess you got to be a pro. Like, what, what's your what's your first time you've won any money playing golf? So my first pro start was right after the U.S. Open in 2016 at Oakmont, which I played yep. good, and I, yep. I won low amateur. It was congressional. It was at that time the Rocket Mortgage. Right. And I finished third, right. and my first ever check was four four hundred thousand dollars. Okay, did you go and buy anything? Like Cam Smith, we mentioned he, he's into his boats. Are you a spender, or did you put it in the bank, Johnny? No, so uh, I did. Boy, I, I listen. I needed to buy a car because I didn't have one, so I did buy a car. And uh, let's just say about a more expensive car than I would have otherwise. Uh, I ended up buying, uh, it was 2016, and even then I tried to be responsible. It was a used 2014 uh, Panamera GTS. Okay. So that was my first okay. purchase. Okay. So you talk about winning there. I needed a car. I didn't need that car, but I needed a car. <laughs> that was that was excuse. My dad was not happy. It was one of the funniest things to go back in time now and think, because I remember him, I told him, he thought I was going to buy a, like a Toyota, a 4Runner, because that's what I told him I was going to do. The next thing he knows, here I am with a Panamera, and I can just, I remember him, he, you, you are driving a Panamera, you? <laughs> it's just the, I tried to tell him, my dad, it was a good price, like I did my work, this and that, you? That's <laughs> still going to be great, and I, and I will tell him now, they still, because the funny thing about that now is, I have an emotional connection to the car, so I couldn't sell it, so I actually sent it to Spain for them, my parents to drive, and for them to have, and it's so funny how he loves it now, and I tell him, hey, remember how mad you were? He's like, ah, oh, I was that mad. Like, my brother's there in the background, like, oh no, he was pissed. I'm like, I know. It was just great one of the funniest story, things now. Great story. So we get, we get to January 2016, the Farmers Insurance, your first PGA Tour win, where I was looking at it this morning, Johnny, you hold a, a, like a 60 footer, um, an incredibly long putt, um, and then, like, I don't know if you're well changed. Did you, like, like what what does it, what does it do as a professional athlete to all of a sudden realise that yeah, okay, I'm here, I can do this. So, I think throughout my career, I can go back in the situations where I say I, I see myself go to the next level and then prove myself that I belong there. Luckily, when I was in college, my third year in 2015, I finished fifth in the Phoenix Open as an amateur. Right. So I felt like I had the talent to be there. And when I won the tournament, more than, you know, I belong, it was more of a thank God it came this quickly, right? Like, thank God this happened this fast and and it's over with. Uh, Especially the fashion I did. It's not only that part. I shot six under on the back nine, eagled both par fives. Birdie 17 and then make that long putt on 18, which people don't know golf or not. I know 60 feet is a long putt, but it was very downhill. It was about a ball. Like all I had to do was hit it 10 feet and it was going to get to the hole. So it was more of a hope it hits the line, and if not two putt. I, with a two putt, I would have still won the tournament. But making that putt and just stealing it was absolutely incredible. Um, you dream of things like that, right? You dream of your win to be something that static and that exciting but when it happens it's actually hard to believe like i couldn't sleep that night seeing that putt over and over because i couldn't <laughs> believe that it actually happened uh and it was yeah it was just more that relief of okay it's done i've won my tournament finally and um keep on going before we talk about keeping on going what, what i've learned doing this show john is for every success there is a lot of failures that build that success and obviously in golf you know there's one successful player and there's 120 odd that that aren't and and I tried to read and I couldn't really find anything take me to a tournament where you think you could have got the job done and you didn't and how you mentally go and work through that and get over that and what that does for you so the failure that may somewhere down the track create success well the biggest one I would say for me was the players I had the lead on Sunday and had a terrible round. And even through my bad moments, uh, I was I still had my chances and just completely handled it so wrong and ended up losing it, right? Um, What'd you do wrong? A lot of things. Okay. Um, okay. I think, so at first, I had a very hard time that day maintaining myself in the present and just 
playing golf like I do, right? I was too reactive of what other people were doing. Okay. Because if you go through the round early on when people make birdies, I make bogeys, and then other players start making mistakes, and then I make birdies, right? So it, it was uh, it was very much a reactive round and rushed. The whole day I just felt rushed. I never took my time and, and really centered myself, right? And um, I was playing good enough to win. That was one of those where I shot 64 the day before to take the lead. I was playing really good golf, and there's really no excuse besides just not handling that that moment properly. So in a situation like that, in, in, in a situation like that, you walk off the course. Are you an athlete that it stays with you for a minute, an hour, a month? And what do you learn in those situations? Well, from every mistake, there's an opportunity, right? So okay. Okay. you can choose to learn. That was really the first time I had the lead in a big event going into Sunday. Um, uh, it hurt. It hurt. I'm not going to lie. The place is the tournament you know you've dreamed of winning and it's not an easy one to win on and it hurt not to get it done i knowing that it was my fault and i could have done so many more things better but with that said i will be usually no matter what happens bad i'm angry for tops 30 minutes to an hour after the round uh or until i get some food sometimes (laughs) i guess it's Like that's that's what my my wife knows. If I'm coming steaming off the golf course and I see her, she knows not to say much, but she knows. Okay, we need to get him food just because you play, you're tired, and just just eating and sitting down just makes you rethink, right? Um, and pretty quickly, I just get to normal. So at the end of the day, yeah, I mean it's just golf, right? My life off the golf course doesn't drastically change whether I win that or not, right? Especially, we have a lot of positives going for me. So once that happens you got to learn and analyze what you did wrong, what happened, and then try to improve upon that. Okay. So It's part of the it, process. So Whether it, you win or not, the next day you're still waking up and going to practice again. So it, it really is just the process. So in Australia, we obviously have um, the Australian guys um, can compete in the President's Cup, which is an amazing event, but you Europeans have the Ryder Cup. I was looking back. I actually watched it. I, John, I, I went to watch 10 minutes of you playing Tiger in the Ryder Cup in 2018 as the youngest player in the um, European team, and I watched an hour. So you cost me a bloody hour this morning because it was captivating. What, what is it What is it like? Talk to me about Ryder Cup as a kid playing against arguably the greatest golfer of all time, who you ended up beating. So what a lot of people don't know about that week is I had my wisdom teeth taken out 10 days before the week of the Ryder Cup. Because I had an infection, Ouch. I had to. So I didn't, I wasn't allowed to eat solid food till like Ryder Cup week. Uh, and I just hit it terrible. Like I was playing terrible, terrible golf. And then Saturday night, I see the parents and I get paired with Tiger Woods. And the panic level was at an all time high. <laughs> Tiger had just won. I'm like, he's playing good. Ideally, that golf course fits his game more than me at that point. The longer the golf course, the better. That one's not. And I was like, oh, man, this is terrible. Luckily, we had a lead, but I'm like, oh, this is just unfortunate in many ways. And it took a lot to uh, to flip that right into into a positive. Uh, a lot of conversations with Tommy Fleet would have played Tiger a couple of times and Thomas Bjorn and coming up with maybe a game plan. And the one thing I learned is, okay, I got to go out there and play – Myself, even though it's match play and I'm playing Tiger Woods, I got to almost try to eliminate him from the picture and just forget that he's there, right? Because it is Tiger, even though you're in Europe, he's going to have a lot of support, especially having just been that comeback in 2018, right? So uh, that was my plan. I just tried to walk and not even see him there, right? Just have somebody I had to beat and that was it. Uh, and we had a really good match. I actually played really good golf, uh, played great golf on that Sunday. The only mistake I'd say I would made was missing um, about a three, four foot putt on 16 to go to 17 with a two up lead. Uh, but then was able to birdie 17 to win it. So it was uh, it was quite quite great, honestly. I started great, put the ball in the fairway on one, hit it to three feet, made the putt, started with a one up lead and, and seeing that crowd support it. It's hard to explain. Uh, the way I tell people, I think I have the biggest overreaction to making a four footer ever in golf. And that was the, the winning putt on 17. But if I, when I tell you the story, so my grandfather had just died that summer who really wanted to see me in the Ryder Cup and he was 
my biggest fan, right? You know, my, my grandparents were a big part of my life. And when I'm re- reading that putt, I'm aware of the moment because I know Tiger's there, right? I'm like, okay, well, if I tie the hole, worst case, I go one up to 18, but I did not want to see 18 because it's really hard hold. Anything could happen, right? Like, when I make the putt, I've just missed the three footer. So that memory's still there. <laughs> And while I'm reading it, I'm obviously aware of my grandpa, but somebody yells in Spanish, do it for Sevi. Now, as such a big Sevi fan as I am, the, 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 the amount of pressure I felt in the moment, like, oh my God, how come this guy is just telling me this now? <laughs> right? But it almost instantly flipped, and I thought of my grandpa and Sevi up in heaven just together wheeling that ball into the hole, just helping me out, right? So I instantly, it was like from pressure to almost an uplifting feeling to where I went to that ball thinking, oh, this is this is going in. There's no way. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I hit a perfect putt. He goes dead center. And the reaction is my first ever Ryder Cup point. I beat Tiger Woods, which is my all-time hero. Um, and then the, the the feeling of my of my grandpa and Sammy up in heaven, right? So that's why that reaction was what it was. Uh, I actually turned around and when I shake Tiger's hand, I, I apologize because I'm fully aware that maybe it was too much. Uh, but he was very gracious and told me, dude, don't worry about it. Like, it's deserved, well learned. But uh, but yeah, there was a lot going on. And on top of that, it's a Ryder Cup. I mean, it's, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> it's funny that you're in some ways apologetic and you're. I can understand you speaking to your opponent, but that when I saw your celebration on that, not knowing the backstory. That's when I immediately thought the punters, the crowd as we call them here in Australia, are going to love this bloke at Live in Adelaide because he plays with emotion and passion. So it's funny how you're almost half apologetic for it where I'm like, this is what I want from golf. This it's, is the it's, entertainment. It's only because I respect Tiger so much. And yeah, and I get that. Yeah, I get that. It, it's just out of like, oh, man, I got like not apologetic for winning but for the reaction. Yep. Yeah, I get it. How to do the it. longer I putt I, I think is completely excused. Like my reaction at the US Open – and a Tory Pines, I'm perfectly excused, right? I mean, it's a big deal, but that is, I don't know, it's four feet. It's not like I won the Ryder Cup. It was early on, right? It's like, I don't know. I just felt like maybe, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's that's weird, but, it, it, you know, everything together is just, it just came out. You mentioned Tory Pines 2021, your first major. And again, I'm looking at that, your whole uh, ripping putt, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a birdie on 17 to, uh, I think, equal was Swartzel, the South African year, or is it Oosthuizen? No, Swartzel, yeah. Oosthuizen. And then on 18, another birdie. And then, so you, you've almost got your hands, the first Spaniard to win the US Open. And then I love it because in the coverage, they cut and you're on the practice fairway and like, you, Everything you've wanted to achieve since you were a kid is there and you have to wait. What What is that period like? Because he, he's coming up, to, hasn't completed his round, so he can still, uh, unlikely as it was, he can still take you to a playoff. Yeah, so I, I, I took a one-shot lead and he was on 15 green. So I think he two-putted 15 and you're watching in, right? And 15, 16 are not birdie holes. So not that I'm too worried there. 17, if you put the ball in the fair away, it was a possibility because with how firm it was, he could have made birdie. Then 18, same thing, being a par five, right? So uh, that's where I was worried. And then it, it honestly seemed like the longest hour of my life. Was it? Like, it was it? Yeah, because you're not in control, right? Like I just made the pot. I'm in incredible euphoria, right? It's amazing. And then you have to come down and be like, all right, he can still take me to a playoff or he could still actually win. He has the holes. Like, I finished birdie birdie, so he could finish birdie birdie as well. And trying to deal with that was difficult. You go, uh, cameras are following you. They want to see your reaction. I'm watching TV, so <laughs> it's tough. Uh, I remember watching his tee shot on 18 when he went, he hit it in the hazard. And uh, it was one of the most uncomfortable feelings looking at the TV and knowing that there's a camera right in my face. Like, I, I, I can't be happy about it on TV. You can't be doing fist pumps, can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's obviously, I'm not upset to see go on the hazard. And I love Louis because he's a fantastic player and a great guy. But at that moment, I'm not upset, obviously, right? So when I see him make bogey and then he misses the fairway on 18, takes going for the green out of the question and and he has to hold out this wet shot. And, and I'm, I'm hitting shots out on the range just in case because you never know. But at that point, the crowd tells you, right, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting balls and... 
we heard a cheer, but it wasn't a very loud one, like like a whole loud would would entail. So at that point is when I stop and I look, and then they tell us he missed it. You win the tournament. Uh, and it was an incredible moment to share with my wife and our on our newborn Kepa, who was two months old at the time. Um, but you got a baby under your arm. That's what got me when the little fella's under your arm. I think I grow him and I say, "You have no idea what just happened." Yeah. I mean, someday he will. No, not that he would care or not, but uh, you know, not to only win a major, but to to be the first Spanish player to win the U.S. Open was quite incredible. Uh, so you go from one of the highlights of my career to one of the stressful, most stressful hours of my career to then being the champion it is it's such a hard feeling to describe i mean i know golf to a lot of people might not be the most exciting sport in the world but to be a part of it like those roller coasters you can go through it's absolutely incredible i, I only have well one more topic and one question after that so you take as much or as little time on this topic as you please because your time is valuable but i know we're getting you the end but that topic is a little tournament in augusta called the masters before we talk about winning it, Adam Scott came on this show on episode 100 and he told me a story, John. So for those that aren't aware, the winner gets the green jacket for a year. You can take it away from Augusta. He would talk about back back in Queensland, people would be coming around for dinner and he'd just casually leave the green jacket over the couch so when they walked in, they would see the jacket and it would blow them away that there was the master's green jacket. Have I still got you there? I have. So tell... Tell me a story about you and what you've done with your your famous green jacket, which within the year period, I guess you've still got. Yeah, I nothing like that, nothing like that. A lot of people, a lot of people, yeah, will wear it and and go through drive throughs and things like that. I yeah, I just never. <laughs> I probably should do it just for fun and be able to say that I've done it. I think the closer I get to the Masters, the more I'll wear it, just because I know time's coming up, but. Uh, I I have it on my closet, and every every day when I go get dressed, I see it. Every once in a while, I put it on, but I never hasn't ventured out of the house a lot, to be honest. Nothing, nothing special like that. Uh, obviously, I show people, but I don't have it advertised. Let's just say that. And when you show people, does it have like it's it's a green jacket, right? It's just a green piece of cloth. But what type of awe does it bring to people when you show it to them? Most people are speechless. Really? Most people are speechless. Really? Yeah. Wow. Most people are. Wow. Especially if I put it on because, you know, most of the people seeing it are family are close enough to where they understand the significance of it. And, yeah, a lot of people get a little emotional. I get emotional, right, if I start thinking about it too. So, yeah, it's it's it, it's a very special trophy to have that you only keep for a year. It's, it's, uh, it, it's hard to put into words. I, I can't really explain it. So the tournament itself... Um, I, I can summarise it for people, but for the tournament itself, tell me about your, your, your mental state. So day one, you shot seven under, you equal first. Day two, ten under, second behind Kepka on 12. Day three, um, you're nine under, Kepka's 11. Um, but it, it's an unusual tournament because the weather, so you're playing a little bit the next morning, etc. How do you mentally keep... When the pressure of the Masters, when that first thought comes in your head, shit, I could win the US Masters here, which would have been on um, Seve's birthday, how do you mentally process that to not get ahead of yourself and picture in your mind lifting up the trophy? I think that's a challenge every time you're in contention in a tournament. Um, For that one, in a weird way, Friday and Saturday were the easier part because you were, with the rain delays and the weather, you had enough worry, like, when it's pouring down rain and it's blowing wind, you f- you almost forget. Like you're just trying to, you know, deal with the elements and 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 deal with that. So, for that period of time, and it was weird that you're not thinking about golf. It obviously became very very real when Brooks and I teen off last on Sunday. That's when things changed quite a bit, right? That's when you're playing and okay, this is to win it, actually to win it. So. Uh, at first, obviously, I'm chasing Brooks, so I'm not really thinking about winning. But once I take the lead on six, those thoughts do come, and you have to be able to manage them. Uh, so what does that mean? What what does what does manage those thoughts mean? This is the gist of what I wanted to well, ask exactly. you about. Well, you take the lead, you and you're thinking. You're obviously you kind of start having. I I a lot of times have thoughts of, man, imagine we actually have a tap in to win the Masters. <laughs> I imagine right, and I'm like, well, 
it's a whole lot of golf in between to make that happen. So you kind of need to keep yourself on the moment and, and battle those those thoughts that, you, that that come in, right? Not battle, but it almost, you almost need to let them go and just keep focusing on you. And um, I think because that day I, I set myself a target score to shoot, I wanted to shoot 69 or better. Uh, I just kept hacking at that and then just trying to manage the lead, right? Even at that point, I, I'm seeing Jordan Spieth and Phil Mickelson going off, shooting very low um, and, and catching up to, to the lead. So at the same time, you try to distance yourself as much as you can, right? I think it was a two-shot lead starting on 10, and I was able to birdie um, 14. 14. 14. Uh, 13, 14, 12, 13, 14 to make it a four-shot lead, right? So you, you try to still keep playing good golf because – a lot of people that may not know about the history of the game. In 2004, Ernie Els stood on 14 tee box with a three-shot lead, played the last five holes, one under par, and did not win the Masters. We are accustomed to this, mate. We're, we're, yeah, we're accustomed to this with Greg Norman leading Faldo by five shots in the 90s. Australians know the heartbreak of the Masters more than, more than most, to be honest. So you still, you still need to stay in it. And, and keep hitting those shots because they're not easy, right? I hate when people tell me, oh, it's a boring finish. I'm glad it was boring for you because it's very stressful. Uh, <laughs> the only time I was safe is when <laughs> I had the, I feel like I had that third shot on the green and that, on 18 and that was done. So before that, it's a lot of battling of you wanting to win and your feelings and and, and challenge the, the golf course in a way where you can still be aggressive and make birdies, but you never want to give up anything, right? It's is maintaining that sweet spot. But at the end of the day, when you're playing, it's not like you're thinking about all that, right? You're just trying to do what's best for yourself in that moment. Uh, and I think with the pressure being so big on Sunday and you being so nervous, it's almost easier to maintain yourself centered uh, just because you're so aware of everything that's happening, right? It's, it's it, it feels like those black last nine holes are a lot longer than the two hours they really are. Last question I have for you. I realize you've got to go. We have a lot of kids listen to this show and you will understand the responsibility of this because you now have a young family. For all the kids out there, John, that want to achieve success in their field, what lasting piece of advice would you leave them with? This is always very hard. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's different, but you have to find your passion. It's a lot easier to achieve great things when you're passionate about what you're doing because it doesn't feel like work. It's that simple. Going out to practice, going out to to work out and, and spend the time and and the sacrifices that it requires is a lot easier when you absolutely love what you're doing. A lot easier. In fact, it doesn't really feel less like a sacrifice. Maybe to other people it does, but not to you because that's what you want to do. Uh, so once you find your passion, it's still it's just still an immense amount of hard work and dedication to be able to get to to be one of the best in the world or anything. And that's what my dad always said. He's like, son, I don't care if you want to be the best golfer in the world, the best garbage man in the world, the best journalist in the world. It doesn't matter. To be able to get there, you need to you need to have an incredible discipline and incredible work ethic. And uh, yeah, that's what you need to get to. Obviously, there's different ages where. You can make your practice fun and your days entertaining, but it's a lot of hours that you need to spend doing what you need to do to be able to get there. You've been so generous with your time. I could ask you three more hours of questions. We can't wait to see you in Adelaide. Uh, Maybe you have a great time in Saudi Arabia, John. It's been a privilege to have you on the show. Go well, and we can't wait to see you in this part of the world, mate. Good on you. Thank you very much. Thank you.